Since JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3's run on Toonami recently came to a conclusion, I thought I would make this video that I've been desiring to do for quite a while now. I had an enormous amount of respect for the first two parts of this series, and Stardust Crusaders just about undid everything that I thought was great about the prior entries. Right from the very first episode, Part 1 introduced an epic rivalry between the honest gentleman Jonathan Joestar and the malicious yet charming Dio Brando. Their rivalry began with childhood scuffles, and later evolved into a battle between the supernatural, culminating in a thrilling finale where aboard a flaming ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the protagonist, Jonathan Joestar, sacrificed his own life to bring down the now vampiric Dio, or at least seemed to bring down Dio. This clash between opposite standing characters created an intriguing narrative, but Stardust Crusaders came along and brought Dio back as the main antagonist which neutralized everything Part 1 strives so hard to make. With Dio surviving the flaming ship, Jonathan's accomplishments and his sacrifice became meaningless. I've heard some people try to say this made Jonathan become a tragic hero. But the thing is, he was already a tragic hero, because he died saving his family, and the future he saved would never come to know of his sacrifice. Bringing back Dio did not make Jonathan become a tragic hero. It just devalued him and his role for the rest of the franchise. What was great about Part 2 was its graceful transitioning from Part 1, where the surviving cast members at the end of Part 1 wound up felt very believable. Speedwagon immigrated to the United States and became a rich oil tycoon, a thriving business of the time period. He even retained his mannerisms and his love of bizarre hats. And despite a 50-year time gap had passed, he still resembled his younger self despite the fact he had aged. Irina, Jonathan's widow, remained in England, and became a teacher, which fit her caring personality that was established in Part 1. Two major events happened at the end of Part 1. Arena announced she was pregnant with Jonathan's child, and that she managed to rescue an infant, who would later become an integral cast member of Part 2. Late into Part 2 of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, these two children were revealed to be the parents of the new protagonist, Joseph Joestar, and the story went so deep into his parents' backstories that there could have easily been a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 1.5. Another important character from Part 2 was Caesar Zeppeli, who was the grandson of a major character from Part 1. The father of Caesar, who died between Parts 1 and 2, also got a brief backstory. Since the Joe Stars and the Zeppelis have a direct familial lineage to the characters of Part 1, the viewers of the show have an easy time comprehending how the characters from Part 1 and their descendants ended up the way they were. The problem with the transitioning from parts 2 to 3 was that there was not the same deep-rooted connections to the past as there were with parts 1 to 2, and many of the transitionings were not properly explained, and were left up to the assumptions of the viewer rather than being told through storytelling like in part 2. Part 3, also referred to as Stardust Crusaders, really only had two characters that were present that could connect the story to the past, and they are Joseph Joestar and his wife Susie Q, and neither character looked or really felt like their past selves, which was more than just a change of art style. Joseph Joestar's physical appearance actually looked much different than he was in Part 2, and it was more than just aging. His facial structure, particularly around the cheeks, were radically different than they were in the past, and considering the fact that he now sported a beard and a completely different style of clothing, almost made him look more of like a new character rather than a returning character. Now, I'm not saying make Joseph wear a belly shirt in Part 3, but at the very least, they could at least make him wear a scarf, or make him have a color scheme resembling his past self. His personality and role also drastically changed. In Part 2, he was the type of character that made jokes mid-battle, and he had no issues confronting the enemy because of his take-charge personality. He also used strategy and deception on his opponents to win. Many times he uttered his catchphrase, Your next line will be which threw off his opponents, but in Part 3, he mostly relied on his grandson at Jotaro or his friend Avdal to fight for him. He also found himself the butt of many jokes in Part 3, as opposed to making the jokes himself in Part 2. His original catchphrase of, Your next line will be, was absent in Part 3, and it was replaced with what became his more iconic catchphrase, which went a little like this. Oh my God! Which made it more apparent that he was a completely different character. What was also slightly awkward in the character of Joseph in Part 3 was his new profession in the real estate market, 
which was within the realm of possibility of his character introduced in Part 2, but there is no proper link to connect it to it. It would have made more sense if he wound up as a politician or professional gambler, because of his cunning nature that it was established in Part 2. In Part 3, Joseph was pushed to the sidelines, which, considering the fact he was far surpassed in terms of raw strengths and had significantly aged, this was justifiable. But he never contributed to the fight, and even when his side was on the losing end, he was content with just sitting back. The old Joseph would fight back even in unwinnable situations. He could have at the very least given advice to his grandson or his allies, or he could have even try to use deception on the enemy or trickery like he did in the past. The role of Joseph dramatically changed between parts two and three. He went from being the brave problem-solving protagonist to just being a supporting character whose only use was his access to money and being able to get transportation for the group. So this totally betrayed his former self. Susie Q's personality in Part 3 was actually pretty consistent with her younger self. She even mimicked one of her scenes from Part 2, in which she had trouble deciding on what dress Lisa Lisa should wear. Only this time, she was having trouble deciding on what she should wear herself. But she hardly had any screen time in the show, let alone any time to develop connections to the past. Part 3 actually missed opportunities to conjoin the past and present, because there were some relatively young characters introduced in Part 2, that still could have been around in Part 3, like Smokey Brown or Caesar's younger siblings. How Holly the daughter of Joseph was introduced in Part 3 was slightly odd, because she was an American woman who moved to Japan and married a Japanese man, which was very uncommon for its time period, and since this practice was a bit unusual, it should have had a proper backstory to explain why and how this occurred, similar to Joseph's parents, and doing this would help out with the awkward transitioning. Part 2 also expanded upon many of the great ideas that were introduced in Part 1. The role of Hamon was one of these ideas, including new combat uses, its compatibility with other various materials, and even its limitations. For example, an enemy used a certain type of scarf to protect himself from Hamon, and during another battle with Hamon, it was mixed with an oily rope to sever the limb of a vampiric opponent. The series' new antagonist, the Pillarmen, felt like stronger versions of the enemies of Part 1 the vampires, and the Pillarmen even inadvertently have a connection to the antagonist of Part 1, Dio. The leader of the Pillarmen, Cars, actually created the mask which bestowed upon Dio his dark powers. So in a certain sense, Cars is the father of Dio because he gave him his powers, and this shows how Part 2 built off and expanded upon Part 1. Stardust Crusaders deviated completely from the routes that Part 1 and 2 took, in which Hamon was discarded in exchange for stands, which are basically ghost robots made from the user's own souls, typically to fight for its owner. And the returning antagonist, Dio, now fought with his stand, the world, instead of fighting with his old vampiric powers that saved him so many times in Part 1. Hamon was actually ridiculed in Part 3 by Dio. Even though stands were a far more creative idea than Hamon and vampires, the fact that they casted those aside so easily, and even somewhat ridiculed it, made it difficult for fans of the first two parts to enjoy part three. And the fact that Joseph Joestar, who was one of the best Hamon users, opted to use his stand Hermit Purple, which was widely considered the worst stand in the series, in favor of his hard-earned Hamon abilities, didn't help either. Part three introduced the Joestar birthmark, which became an integral symbol in the future of the series. But since it wasn't present in the prior entries, it just made Part 3 seem more of like a new series, rather than continuing the original. To the 2012's anime's credit, it did include the birthmark in a few scenes. What also made Part 3 seem more of like an entirely new series, rather than a continuation of the original, was the fact that Jotaro's last name was Kujo, unlike the previous protagonists, whose last names were Joestar. Plus, since Joe was at the end of the last name of Kujo, the nickname Jojo didn't work as well with him. So, coupled with the fact that he lacks Hamon and is from an entirely different continent than his predecessors, this makes him feel like he is not directly from the Joestar lineage, as the story intends to. One thing about Part 3 that was drastically different than its previous entries, and even its future entries for that matter, was its episodic nature. Because the cast was larger in Part 3, most of the characters didn't really serve a purpose in the long run. Like, if you miss an episode or a chapter in Part 3, 
it's no big deal, but if you miss one single chapter in part one or two, you'll have a much more difficult time understanding what is going on. One of the problems with being episodic was having continuity errors, typically involving injuries, and character development feeling fraudulent. The characters of part three feel like they're companions because of circumstance rather than actually liking each other. And at the end of the story, they almost randomly act like they're the best of friends, despite parts 1 and 2 combined possessing fewer episodes than part 3, part 1 and 2 still feel like they are building relationships. The first two parts had the main characters undergo harsh training, which not only sharpened their battle skills, but also made the characters bond through mutual experiences. Whereas part 3 was written in a manner where training was not required, the characters of part 3 missed out on the bonding experiences that the characters from the previous entries had. Another issue concerning the episodic nature of Part 3 was the fact that characters unlocked abilities for no apparent reason, which was honestly just bad writing, and it made it feel like that there was no underlying plan all along. But in Parts 1 and 2, I previously mentioned how the characters had to undergo training sequences, so when the characters of Part 1 and 2 unlocked new abilities, it made sense since they had undergone training. One of the greatest elements of the first two parts was how the setting established a time period and its location. Part 1 was set in England during the late 1880s, and the mannerisms and the art style really made it feel like the late 1880s. Jonathan's chivalrous behavior was the encouraged attitude of the time, which further cemented the realism of the setting's era. Even through minor details, like the type of outfits people wore and the type of weapons that were used supplemented the believability of the setting. The real-world serial killer Jack the Ripper of London was also present in this arc, and he actually committed murders during the exact same year this story was meant to take place in. So his inclusion to the story gave a real-world link to the late 1880s of London. Part 2 was actually superior with establishing the setting than Part 1, because it used more real-world event markers like race relations through the character of Smokey, Nazis, Joseph using a Tommy gun, and even the vehicles on the road. All of these were synonymous with the late 1930s of the world. Part 2 even used more landmarks to help establish the location, such as the Mouse of Truce in Italy, and much of the show took place in instantly recognizable locations such as New York City and Venice, and by using these iconic cities, the setting always felt believable to the audience. I felt that JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3 failed to use the setting to the same degree as the prior entries. For example, since Part 3 was traveling from Japan to Egypt, the majority of the places they visited were not as instantly recognizable as the locations used in Part 2. The only place that felt very recognizable was Japan in the very first few episodes, which was mainly because the cast was visiting Jotaro's authentic Japanese house, and because many of the characters wore school uniforms unique to Japan. Even in a more instantly recognizable city like Hong Kong, Part 3 never really captured the image of Hong Kong, and the fact that they fought Polnareff, a Frenchman there, didn't really help it establish the Hong Kong vibe either. Also, Part 3 did not feel like as much of a period piece as the first two parts, mainly due to much of the story taking place in deserts or in impoverished villages, and both of those ideas clash with the common perception of the 80s. Elements that did resemble the 80s almost felt more like isolated incidents rather than actually helping to set the time period. For example, the character of Steely Dan, or in the dub's case, Dan of Steel, dressed a typical 80s fashion, but because the people around him wore clothes meant to survive the harsh climate of the desert, it just felt like Dan's gimmick rather than him representing the trends of the time. Part 3 felt more relatable to modern times, actually, rather than the 80s, probably because this was the only portion of the original franchise that was set in the same year as it was being written. Parts 1 and 2 were set decades earlier and parts 4 through 6 were set years in the future. So the fact that this was set in the same year as it was being written contributes to the fact that it didn't feel like a period piece. So to categorize the issues with part 3, I would say that part 3 radically altered the path that the first two took. So if you're not from Japan or new to the series, you probably started with the 2012 anime adaptation. And if you continued on to part 3, you might feel alienated because of the many alterations. But if you started reading in the middle of the manga, you probably won't share the same grievances as the people who started from the beginning. Now in hindsight, many of the changes might make sense, like changing the setting from Europe to Japan, because the target audience was the Japanese teenagers. So making the main character Japanese would appeal more to the target audience. Now upon reflection, I've actually compiled a few ways to better connect Part 3 to the past, and to better utilize the missed opportunities 
without changing the story too much. And to begin, I would start off by making Jotaro be born and raised in East Berlin, rather than Japan. The first reason is that when many people think of the 80s, the Berlin Wall comes to mind. So making the Berlin Wall be part of the setting would give Part 3 more of an 80s vibe. Plus, the people of Berlin could actually have the fashion, culture, and trends of the 80s, unlike many of the Middle Eastern towns visited during Part 3. If Jotaro's mother moved to East Berlin, she could have had a much more rational backstory than if she moved to Japan. And her backstory could have gone something like this. A young and inexperienced college girl goes to college and comes out favoring the political situation in East Germany, which, if you know the era of the late 60s and early 70s, was quite common amongst most colleges. One thing that I gotta say about Part 3 that always rubbed me the wrong way is that Jotaro's mother moved to Japan to be with his father. But when she's ill, the father is never around. But if she moved to Berlin of her own free will and ended up in a relationship, it would not have felt as mean-spirited for the father not being there. On another note, much of the script could stay the same or only have to be slightly modified to make sense. For example, Joseph didn't like his daughter marrying a Japanese man, but all you have to do to make it work in my script would be have him not liking the fact that his daughter married a communist which would work well because Joseph's become a wealthy realtor. The main plot of Part 3 was traveling to Egypt from Japan, but if the plot was traveling to Egypt through Europe, that could help express the 80s better than traveling through Asia. This pass could include instantly recognizable cities like Paris, Madrid, and Rome, which would allow more time to develop characters rather than having to constantly explain the new locations and the new unknown cities. They could also fight Polnareff in his home country of France rather than Hong Kong. The characters of Whole Horse could have been further developed if he was fought in Europe. If Whole Horse was fought in Europe, specifically Italy or Spain, he could have been rationalized to be a spaghetti western movie star, which would explain his attire. Just in case you don't know, spaghetti westerns are European cowboy movies primarily made by Italians and filmed in Spain. Dealing with characters in their home countries would have felt more believable and less awkward, as opposed to fighting Europeans in East Asia. Along this route, Joseph might have been able to reminisce about the past, in places like Italy and Switzerland, which could have helped Part 3 feel like it belonged with the earlier established parts of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. With this new route, Part 3 could still retain its sea battles and most of its desert fights. The sea battles could all take place in the ocean between Southern Europe and North Africa, and much of the Arabian deserts, where the desert fights took place, could be substituted for the North African terrain. The character of Kakyoin could still be included in this story. Since he is still young and in school, he could be a foreign exchange student at Jotaro's high school. In the story, Kakyoin at an early age had trouble making friends, because his stand would often act strange around others, which caused people to perceive him in a negative light. So having Kakyoin be a foreign exchange student could actually work out better, because it could be Kakyoin trying to make a fresh start in a new life without the preconceived notions of the past. Plus, having him be a foreign exchange student could work into the favor of the transitioning into Part 4. Overall, all these ideas would have provided a better transitioning from Part 2 into Part 3, and it would have expanded upon many of the great ideas introduced in Part 3. My next modification to Part 3 would be Joseph and Holly starting off without stands, or at least not possessing them at the very beginning of the story. The first thing that this would correct is that Joseph would be forced to rely more on Hamon, which would have prevented it from diminishing in value in Part 3. Maybe even Joseph could have later fought one of Dio's minions who possessed vampiric abilities. If Joseph started off without a stand, he could still go on to later gain a stand, which could show story progression and an underlying narrative for Part 3, rather than feeling so episodic. Making Joseph gain a stand in the middle of the story would also make Joseph feel more relevant as a character instead of just being a supporting character. He could even use his newly acquired stand to fight in a manner more reminiscent of his fight against a Pillarman. For example, he could combine Hermit Purple and Hamon to use a technique that resembled Wamu's Divine Sandstorm, which would make it feel more like Joseph learned from his experiences in Part 2. Now on to what I would do different with Holly. One thing about Holly's character in Part 3 that always felt goofy was the fact that she nearly died because she couldn't control her own stand, which would have been an okay idea if more characters were brought down by their own stands. But considering the fact that infants later in the series can use stands with absolutely no repercussions, 
This just made the idea completely fall apart. If Holly never got her stand, she never would have gotten sick, and the gang would not have a reason to pursue Dio. So what my reason to make the gang pursue Dio is, I would simply have one of Dio's minions take her by force. So this would have been more of a rescue mission, rather than a convoluted mission of defeating Dio to make her healthy again. Now, you might be wondering why I would still let Jotaro possess his stand, but not his progenitors. Well, the way I would let him have his stand is by having him be the son of Dio, who would have already had a stand. This would, indeed, lessen the impact of some of the future entries of the series. But this trade-off would fix so many of the issues plaguing Part 3, such as how Jotaro randomly gained the ability to stop time, which, if Dio was indeed the father of Jotaro, could have easily been explained as being acquired hereditarily. It would also explain the many similarities between their two stands, Star Platinum and the World. Having Jotaro hereditarily inherit a stand would also make much more sense than randomly gaining a stand because an ancestor who no longer had any influence over the current generation's genetics gained a stand himself. Plus, the main goal of Dio in Part 1 was to infiltrate and destroy the Joestar family, which if he managed to reproduce with Holly, Joseph's daughter, he would have successfully completed his own mission from Part 1, thus making Part 3 seem more of an expansion of the series, rather than an entirely new different story. In the manga, Jotaro's father was a traveling jazz musician, and it felt awkward that he prioritized his job over returning to his ailing wife during her time of need. But if Dio was the father, he could have just abandoned Holly after getting her pregnant as an act of revenge against the Joe Stars, and there would not have been the awkward element of the absent father. And if Dio was the father, it would have made much more sense on why Holly would have been willing to be captured by Dio's minions. I was always a tad bit disappointed in the ending of Part 3, because Dio's body was just laid out in front of the sun and it got incinerated due to the fact that vampires are weak against sunlight, and it almost seemed casual. Now if Dio was Jotaro's father, destroying Dio's body would not necessarily mean they beat Dio, because Jotaro's existence would mean that to a certain degree, Dio won, and the ending would have been much more complex and deep, and after that, nothing would have been the same. Jotaro would have killed his own father. Holly would see her son as the killer of the man she loved, and Joseph would see Jotaro as the son of the enemy of the family. Part 3 felt like it was made just so Dio could be brought back, rather than actually moving the story ahead. But with my ending, Part 3 would have had more of a purpose than its basis. There are also some minor alterations I would apply to Dio's character, primarily to make him closer to who he was in Part 1. First off, I would change who his henchmen were. Like how earlier I said one of his henchmen was Jack the Ripper in Part 1, so I think in Part 3, one of his henchmen should be the Zodiac Killer, which would keep up with his trend of having killers being his henchmen. The Zodiac murders ended around the same time Jotaro was born, so his disappearance could also coincide with Dio's reappearance. The Zodiac Killer's appearance would also help establish the time era that this story was supposed to take place in. Dio should have more vampiric henchmen, because it allowed Joseph more opportunities to use Hamon, which in turn would help make Joseph feel more relevant within the story, and it would give more reverence to Hamon. My previously mentioned ideas would alter the plot of Part 3, but not its story. I commonly find that most people praise Part 3 not for its characters or plot, but for its story, which was about a group of fighters' comedic adventures on their way to Egypt to stop an ancient evil. My alterations retain what was great about Part 3, but better utilize the missed opportunities and further improve upon the character's motivations. To sum up my changes, I would say I changed the route, but not the destination. Thank you for watching this video. It took a lot longer than I originally anticipated. If you thought my ideas were creative, or if you have any better ideas, feel free to comment below. If you're curious about more of my videos, my next video will be about my least favorite arc in One Piece. Thanks for watching.